Hello Algebra 1. In Chapter 1.6 we start talking about organizing information in tables and graphs. Some of you suggested that a way of organizing the information in word problems that we were solving recently um, was to put it into a table and you found using that table helpful to you. Well all of you should remember in fact that back in one of the very first days of our class I said that um, tables and graphs were two of the five ways that we would be learning in this class to organize and describe patterns. So let's get going with that. Example one right out of your textbook is this table and they suggest um, that you uh, think about how you uh, that make use of this information. Well first let's, let's make sure before we go any farther that we read it carefully. So hit the pause button. Okay, I'm going to assume that you did that. So let's make sure that we've all um, got the same ideas in mind about um, what's being shown here. Clearly everything's being organized by year and the years change by five year intervals. They jump by five years. And they're looking at amounts of dairy and vegetables and fruit. And this title kind of says it um, in a pretty nice fashion here. Uh, the top categories of food consumed by Americans. Key point here though is that these numbers represent pounds per person per year. So one person in one year apparently would have had 568 pounds of dairy. I imagine that means milk and cheese and I, I don't know what all else, butter, um, in 1990. Or similarly in 1975 the average American would have had 252 pounds of fruit. Okay, let's carry that a little forward. Let's actually use the table as they suggest. In which five year period, as it asks here, did the, the total consumption go up the most? And total consumption is of all these things, dairy, fruit, and vegetables combined. And then also when was there the, um, a total decrease in consumption? Hit the pause button, come back and I'll show you the answers. Okay, well if you've read the textbook you know how to do this already, but if you haven't, it suggests in the textbook add two more rows to the table. Put in a row of the total amount and a row that shows how much the total changed. So now what I want you to do, now that you see that there, I want you to actually go ahead and answer these two questions. In which five year period did it increase the most and in which five year period was there a decrease? Hit the pause button, come back and we'll answer that question. Okay, I'm going to assume that you did that. The increase, the greatest increase I should say, happened from 1980 to 1985. It went up by 79, roughly 79 pounds, 79.2 pounds per person per year. That means that if you took 1221, which was the total of these three numbers in 1985, and then subtracted 1142, the difference is 79.2. Okay, so similarly, the decrease happened from 1970 to 1975, and that's easier to see because it's the only negative number in this row of changes, um, the negative 8.7. One of the hardest things about reading a table like this is realizing this negative 8.7 talks about the change between these two years. And they could have actually put that negative 8.7 in between these two to show that it was the change between, just like 50.1 is the change from 1990 to 1990. It's not all in 1995 here. But that's the way the author has organized this information in this table, and you might organize your table differently. Now we get on to bar graphs, an example two. And here's the bar graph that they present. And what I want you to do, as the textbook suggests, is look at it carefully and explain why could this graph be considered misleading. Okay, I'm going to assume that you hit the pause button. If you didn't, go ahead and make sure you do. But I'm going to go ahead and show you the textbook's answer to this question. They point out this break right here in the vertical, um, uh, the vertical axis of the graph. It goes from zero, it jumps to 1125. And then after that, it keeps going up by 25 unit intervals. These 25 units, by the way, are pounds per person. But for some reason, it doesn't jump 25 units here. It jumps 1,125. So that's the issue that could make this misleading. And if you didn't have a break like that, if you instead had a almost a stretched out graph, this
this way, the textbook shows that this is what you would get. And I'm the one raising the question, the textbook doesn't. I'm asking, is this better? This information goes up consistently on the left axis, just like it does on the bottom axis. The bottom axis, it's five-year intervals, like we said back when it was a table. And the vertical axis is 200 pound intervals. And every one is consistent with the one above and below it. So you might say this is better because it's, um, it is less likely to be misleading. It's also clearly more boring. There doesn't seem to be as exciting a story to tell about this as there was back here where it looked like it was shooting upward. Well, there's another thing to say about this besides the fact that um, this version is a little more boring. The fact of the matter is sometimes when you have a graph like this, you can lead somebody to think there wasn't much change, but sometimes a very small change can have a dramatic influence. Think about, for example, we've been talking about climate change and the change in a degree or two on average per year is making a dramatic change in some scientists' minds about climate, most scientists' minds about climate. Similarly, um, a change in the percentage of people who are unemployed, if it's a 1% change, um, one percentage point change, that can have a dramatic impact on the economy. So these small changes can have dramatic influences. And so this might lead you, or even lull you, you might say, into thinking there's not much of a difference. Where a story like that might, even though it runs the risk of being misleading, might more clearly point out to you that something dramatic has happened over the course of 1970 to 2000. Okay. But by the way, that doesn't mean that I'm saying, let's just be clear about this, I'm not saying that this is worse than that. They are different and both have their places. Okay, now moving on to making a line graph. Example three, and I think this is the last example from the textbook. They give you this data in a table. So before we go any farther, hit pause and make sure you understand the data. Okay, I'm going to assume you read that. And what it's showing you here from 1983 to 1996 is the average cost of making a movie. And these numbers are millions of dollars. So it wasn't $17.50, it was $17.5 or $17.5 million. By the way, this is not really intended to be broken, it just wouldn't fit. It goes to 1989, and then there's 1990 and 1991, and it wraps around that way. So now they ask you to draw a line graph of the data. I'm not going to ask you to do that now because you're going to have that assignment on the homework. I'm just going to jump ahead and show you the line graph that the textbook has. There it is. There's the textbook's um, line graph. And the textbook has you look at that and answer some questions. But before you do that, I just want you to hit the pause button and read this and make sure you understand it. OK, I'm going to assume that you did that. And now that I'm, I'm going to move ahead to the questions the textbook raises. Both of those. I want you to think about both of those. Which three-year period? Did the average cost decrease? And in which year was there the greatest decrease? So hit the pause button, and then I'll show you the answers when you come back. OK, I'm going to assume that you did that. There are the textbook's answers. There were three um, times when the average cost of making a movie went down. Clearly, and it's easier to see with a line graph, it dipped down there once, and it dipped down there twice, and it's dipping down here at the very end in 1996, like they say. But the greatest of those three de decreases was this last one, this drop from 1995 to 1996. How do we know? Because that's the steepest change from the year before. Okay, and that brings up an important point. When would you actually use these? Well, we were just looking at line graphs. Line graphs are really good, like we just indicated, at showing changes over time. I can very quickly see, ah, that's where it dropped down, and that's where it dropped down the most. But generally, I can see it's going upward. So that's nice about line graphs. I'm just reading this list from the bottom up this time, from the most recent topic, and working backward. Bar graphs are nice if you really want to see that side-by-side -side comparison. And I'm going to show you another bar graph in just a second to, to emphasize that point. 
But in any graph, the nice thing about the graph is that you can compare two sets of data. For example, you might want to compare the month to how much snow fell or how many tourists came. Similarly, you might want to compare how much training somebody has had and how much education somebody's had to what kind of salary they earn. It's easier to see that comparison between two sets of data when you look at a graph, easier than it is with a table. But a table's nice. If you really want to see the specific numbers, you can't nearly as easily see the specific numbers when you're looking at a graph as you can with a table. That's why, for example, in sports, the one lost records of sports teams in the newspaper are usually reported in tables because you really want to see the specific numbers and see how much your favorite team has to do in terms of winning to catch up to somebody that's ahead of them. Okay, I promised to talk a little bit more about bar graphs. There are two ty types discussed in the chapter, standard, like these on the left, and stacked bar graphs on the right. These actually show the same data, 1991 to 1996, 1991 to 1996, millions, uh, number sold in millions, number sold in millions of CDs, cassettes, and albums, CDs, cassettes, and albums. The difference is here, the three types, CDs, cassettes, albums, are side by side. And that's one of the nice things about a bar graph, is it gives a nice side by side comparison. Stacked bar graphs put the CDs, cassettes, albums all from 1991 on top of each other, and instead the side by side comparison is between 1991 versus 1992. Okay, your homework. On page 43 to 47, I think it's actually 43 to 45, I'll double check that. Yeah, it, it, it is page 45 that it's supposed to end on. On 43 to 45, do these problems here. 3 through 7, and then 8 through 20. And I'll see you in class.